Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You, God, for what You're doing in our church. And I pray that You'll continue to do it, to do so in my life also. Work in our hearts now through Your Word. I pray that You'll help me as I preach to do so in clarity and in faithfulness to the text of Your Word and to do so in power of the Holy Spirit. May it change us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, do you remember the television show called Fear Factor? All right, is this on? Okay. Um, that's, for some reason, I'm not hearing it real well, but that's just me. I am half deaf, so. Uh, do you remember the, the Fear Factor? Uh, I, now, I watched like half of one episode. I mean, I just couldn't take it. It just wasn't my thing, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I had to actually look this up on Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience, but Fear Factor, uh, basically, it... it the contestants of the show had to go through three stunts. They had to pass three stunts in order to compete and win the $50,000 prize. And the stunts were really, well, it, this is kind of self-explanatory, it tested their fortitude against fear, right, whatever they were afraid of. The first stunt, you know, one stunt would be like an athletic challenge. They might have to tightrope real high across, I, I think the one episode I did watch, uh, the, they had like a, a rope bridge strung between two skyscrapers way up in the air, and these guys had to tight rope across it and grab something and bring it back. And, uh, and, and they had a, you know, they had a thing. Uh, that if they fell, they wouldn't fall all the way. But uh, anyway, they had to do that. And, and uh, I think one, and I was looking at that, and I, I, would, I was thinking as long as I have, you know, a rope on me, I think I'd be okay. But, uh, but then there were some other things that they, one, sometimes they had to sit in a tub of snakes or spiders, or roaches, big roaches, you know. Uh, and so they do, and, or eat nasty stuff. And, and so it was just, the whole object was to face fear and, and, and beat it. It's called Fear Factor. And usually the contestants of the show wanted the money really bad. I mean, they 50000 yeah, they wanted the money. Uh, but many of them, most of them, never obtained the prize because fear won. Uh, fear stopped them from doing what they really wanted to do. And you know, as Christians, we have a great commission from our Lord Jesus Christ. He's called us, He's saved us and called us to follow Him. He commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. He told us to be His witnesses in our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. And yet, when I examine my life, I find that the Great Commission many days becomes the Great Omission. I'm not saying that I never witness. I do witness. And I'm not saying that I don't want to witness. I do want to witness. But what I'm saying is that I do not witness as often and as boldly as I ought to witness as often and as boldly as Christ wants me to witness. How about you? Am I alone in this? I don't think so. What's the problem? Why? Why don't we witness? Why is the Great Commission many days in my life, why is it the Great Omission? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We're busy, we're tired, maybe sin. You're living in sin and letting that defeat you, you're not going to witness. Maybe just not concerned with the lost. But there is one major reason why we don't witness. It's fear, isn't it? Sometimes we're just scared to witness. There's a fear factor when, when it comes to our privilege and our responsibility to carry out the Great Commission. Why do we fear? What do we fear? We fear rejection. Nobody likes rejection. I've heard people say, well, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Then why are you telling me? You know, <laughs> you, you're telling me because you want me to be impressed that you don't care what I think. Uh, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, uh, rejection, we fear that. We fear opposition or slander. People might talk about us or even persecution. That happens in America, by the way. We think of many times, we've been conditioned in our lives to think that persecution is something that only happens overseas. No, it happens in America. 
When Jesus sent out his 12 disciples on their first preaching mission, when the 12 disciples became the 12 apostles, and they left Jesus' side to go out to the cities of, the, uh, of Galilee to preach the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus told them what to expect. He didn't send them out blind. He, he, he sent them out with information. He told them, the fields are, are white unto harvest. They're ready. He told them to pray for laborers, pray for soul winners to go into that harvest. And then Jesus personally called and sent the twelve apostles to be the answer to their own prayers. Before sending them, though, Jesus told them what to expect. Jesus said, expect rejection. Expect opposition. Expect people to slander you. Expect persecution. And Jesus said that households and cities would refuse their message. He said that they would be sheep in the midst of, in the den of wolves. He said, I'm sending you sheep into a den of wolves. He said they would persecute you. In, in, he said the, 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 the apostles would be persecuted in synagogues and in the courts of the land. And, and Jesus told them that their message would divide households and that people everywhere would hate them. It's not much of a pep talk, is it? <laughs> Could you imagine if your team is at halftime and you're supposed to play and the coach comes in and he's going to give the pep talk? He says, guys, let's go out there and get them. We're going to lose by 50 points. It's going to be awesome. The other team is going to break your leg and they're not going to call a foul. Let's go get them. Woohoo! Not much of a pep talk. I imagine that after hearing these things, the 12 apostles were nervous about preaching the gospel. Maybe even scared. And because of that fear factor, Jesus taught them how to face their fears. How to overcome their fears and boldly share the gospel. You know, I don't, and, and I want you to understand, I'm not talking about sharing your faith. That's kind of a buzzword these days, share your faith. You don't need to share your faith. Share the gospel. All right. Now, sharing your faith is giving your testimony. That's fine. But share the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. That's what the disciples are going to do. So look, let's look here in Matthew chapter 10. We're in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus sends out his disciples. And I want, I want to focus on one verse, and then we're going to kind of back up and, and work back to that verse, if that makes any sense. But uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. Matthew 10, verse 27. Jesus says to his disciples, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. That is the mission. It's a command Jesus was giving to his disciples uh, to take what he taught them in secret and give it to others openly. And so he had been teaching them. And he says, what, you, what I've told you in darkness, maybe after uh, ministering all day long as they, they sat down to go to sleep and maybe had a campfire and they were eating their dinner or something like that, Jesus would teach his disciples. And he would tell them uh, uh, the gospel. And we don't have all that recorded in Scripture, so this is, some of this is my imagination, but I imagine... Uh, Jesus says, I've told you this in the dark of the night or maybe early in the dawn of the morning. I've taught you these things in darkness. I've whispered it in your ears. I've told you quietly when no one was listening. And now is the time to go out and preach it in daylight. Go out and preach the gospel. Now, that's their command. That's what they're told to do. And Jesus, uh, up until this point, has been telling them what to expect when they do this. And so if you'll... Um, if, if you'll understand here, he's going he's gonna to give them a command to go preach the gospel of kingdom. He's, he's going to tell them to raise the, raise the dead, heal, cast out demons, and he's, he's going to tell them what to take with them on their journey. He's going to say, here's guys, you need, you're, you're going on a journey, you, you better be prepared. Take no money, take no extra clothes, no extra shoes, no walking stickers, take nothing with you. Good advice? <laughs> I don't know. Look at verse 7 with me, all right? And he says, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have 
get, receive, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Those are types of coins, gold, silver, and brass. He says, no scrip for your journey. That's a bag of food, all right? No, no bag. Um, neither two, new, two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his hire. And so he tells them what to take with them. And then Jesus is going to explain to them what to do when they arrive at their destination. He says, when you get there, find a family who's worthy or a decent, you know, decent household that's accepting of your message, and, uh, and you'll stay with them while you're preaching in a city. Why would they do that? Well, the inns were not safe. They were dangerous places full of thieves, and also they were, very, they were known for their immorality and things like that. It wasn't like, you know, here, we, hey, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, you know. You wouldn't say that in Jesus' day. You wouldn't want anybody to know about that. So he says, when you find a family that's worthy, you stay at their house. Jesus says, when you come to the worthy house, he says, salute it, or as the Jewish people would say, say shalom, peace to this house, all right? Look at verse Verse 11, and unto whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come to a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. All right? And then Jesus is telling them what to do when they get there and preach. And, and then Jesus begins to teach his 12 disciples how to handle adversity. This is where it gets a little tougher. Uh, the adversity that is going to come on their mission. First, he shows them how to handle rejection. Look at verse 13, the second part here. It says, but if not, if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be t more tolerable in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. When a Jewish man traveled into Gentile lands in Jesus' day, and he returned to the land of Israel from that Gentile land, he would shake off as much dust. He would beat the dust off his feet, off his sandals, and shake that off because that was Gentile dust. And it was, it was defiled in their minds. And they didn't want to bring that into their city or into their home. And so what Jesus is saying here is, when people reject, remember they're preaching only to Israelites, um, when people reject the message, treat them like unbelievers. Treat them like pagan Gentiles. In other words, just move on. Let God deal with them. Right? So he's telling them how to deal with rejection. But rejection isn't the only problem. If it was just rejection, maybe this wouldn't be so big a deal. But Jesus began to warn his apostles about some other problems. He began to warn them about opposition to their message. Not just rejection, but active opposition. And that opposition takes the form of persecution. Look at verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought, or how you shall speak, for it shall be given to you at the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall raise, rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you, not if, but when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come." Now, much of what Jesus is saying here is going to apply to his disciples and his apostles in the long term. Um, see, they went out preaching on this mission, and they didn't face as much persecution as he describes. But as they lived their life, and after Jesus had uh, died and was buried and rose from the grave and ascended into heaven... Uh, all of the apostles, except for one, John, the apostle John didn't, but all the other apostles died a violent death under persecution. 
Um, and so uh, Jesus said they would face two types of persecution, all right, as they preach the gospel. The first type is religious persecution. We saw that in verse 17, that they'd be drugged before councils, is what the Bible says here. And councils were religious courts. These were the councils in the synagogues. And, uh, and, and in those councils, the leaders of the synagogue could punish people who broke the Mosaic law or the rabbinic traditions. And one such, one such prescribed punishment would be scourging. According to the Old Testament law, they could give 40 stripes, 40 lashes with a whip. And so what the, what the rabbis had settled on was 39. They'd say, well, basically the maximum is 40, and that's pretty severe. We'll go 39, so we're not too severe, right? And so, this is, what, this is what Jesus is saying. They're going to try you in church. They're going to take you to the synagogue. They're going to condemn you as a heretic, and they're going to whip you. That's religious persecution. We haven't faced that around here, I don't think. Uh, legal persecution, verse 18. Jesus says, you know, they're, uh, I said, they're, they're gonna brought, you're going to be brought before governors and kings for my sake. And uh, Jesus promised his disciples that they could count on the Holy Spirit. So don't worry. Don't, don't take no thought. Don't worry about what you're going to say when, when this happens. Because the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words. Jesus then warned his disciples about the effect that they're making. You're going to face religious persecution. You're going to uh, face uh, civil or legal per persecution. And now let me tell you about the effect that this gospel is going to have when it sets in. Um, the gospel would have an effect of division. It was going to divide even the most basic unit in society, the family members. In verse, uh, verse 21, And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 34, Jesus told them, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword. For I come to set a man at variance against his father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's the effect of the gospel message. When a member, when one member of a lost family is born again, they're immediately at odds with all the other members of their family. Because they've just become a member of a different family. They've got different fathers. One is of their father the devil, and now the other one is born again into the family of God. They're of their father, God the Father. And they're the joint heirs with Jesus. Here's the worst part. Jesus told them the gospel message would divide them from the rest of the world. In verse 22, he said, everybody's going to hate you. That's division, isn't it? Uh, and so, uh, I've even read about uh, some cultures, when, when someone is converted to Christ, when a child is converted to Christ, the parents hold a funeral service for them because they are dead to them and they will not speak to them again. Other, uh, other you know, when I was in, in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, we had people join our church. Young married couple joined our church and they had gotten married in Iraq and they had to flee the country because their parents were seeking to kill them. Isn't that amazing? That's the effect of the gospel message, Jesus says. And so, um, Jesus uh, tells them, everybody's going to hate you. He says, and when they persecute you, here's some practical information. What do you do when they persecute you? Jesus says, run. <laughs> All right? Don't stand up like, like Custer and make your last stand. Run. Uh, because if you live longer, maybe you, can, maybe you can minister in another city. And that's what the Apostle Paul would do. You know, he'd, he went to Damascus. What did they have to do? They had to let him down the wall in a basket to escape the guard so he could go to the next city and preach the gospel. Verse 23 there. So to sum it all up, Jesus told his apostles, he said, go preach the gospel of the kingdom, what I told you in darkness, preach in light. Don't bring any money. Don't bring any food. Don't bring any provisions or clothes. And then plan to be rejected. Plan, in fact, uh, people are going to persecute you and beat you. And they're, they're, they're going to hate you. And you're, you're sheep going into a den of wolves. They were probably a wee bit scared. They might have been afraid. So Jesus told them not to fear. He told them not just not to fear, but why they shouldn't fear. 
Look at, I want to focus, we're focusing this morning on verses 24 through 31. I want you to see there are three real clear commands in here, and you might find it. The, he says in verse 24, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And... Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Did anybody see the three plain commands? I kind of read them slower. What is it? Three times he says, don't fear, right? Fear not. In my Bible, I don't know if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible. This is why I don't do it. You know, some people read it on the iPad, and that's great. But this is, this is why I do it on paper, because I can circle it and highlight it. And I've circled and highlighted that term in verse 26, fear them not, verse 28, and fear them not. In verse 31, fear ye not. Fear not, three times Jesus commands. So it, we're commanded to witness without fear. Think about that. All right? Now I can stand here and I can tell you how the apostles had much greater reasons to be afraid to witness than you do and, and, and than I do. And I could beat you over the head with that and tell you to suck it up and just, just go out there and don't be afraid. That'd, that'd be pretty interesting. But no amount of pulpit bravado or rhetoric is going to change the fact that next Thursday when the Holy Spirit uh, prompts you to hand out a, a gospel tract to somebody, your hand might not be shaking, but your heart might be trembling. You know that? No, no matter what I say here, when we're all together, uh, that really doesn't affect a whole lot what you do on Tuesday afternoon at the supermarket or in the, or in the office. And so, that's not what God wants us to do this morning. We have a fear problem because we're weak human beings. Jesus knows it. Hebrews 4.15 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was, what, in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Isn't that what it says? Jesus knows it. Jesus shows us then how to witness without fears. He gives us strength so that we can defeat it. He shows us how to overcome fear in these, this little passage of Scripture. If you notice, I don't know if you notice, as we read through this chapter, Jesus is speaking directly to his 12 apostles. He's speaking in the second person, you and, uh, and ye and, and all this stuff. And when we get to verse 24, he starts speaking in the third person, the disciple. The master. You ever know that? You, you know that? And so he, he broadens his scope because this really just applies to all of us. Some of that stuff only applied to them. I mean, we're not going into a synagogue to get scourged, all right? So that really, we're not preaching only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, so some of that really, you've got to be sensitive to, to, to what's going on in the, in the context. The principles apply. But when we get to verse 24, all of this is for us, all right? Now, um, how can we witness without fear? All right, that's what we're talking about this morning. How can I, how can I uh, actually get to the point in my life, and if Jesus commands it, it's possible, by the way, how can I get to the point in my life where I have no fear to hand a track to somebody? Where I have no fear to say, hey, did, did you know that you know, all men are sinners and there's a penalty for that? How do we get to that point where I can do that without fear? Well, the first step in that process is this. Imitate Christ. Imitate Christ. Be like Jesus. I want, you to, show, I want to show you here in, in verse 24 what, what he says. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Now, who's the disciple and who's the master, right? We're the disciples. 
He's the master, all right? But look at verse 25. Read with me the first three words. It is enough, all right? It is enough for what? For the disciple to be as his master. Jesus said, there is nothing more that you need to do than to be like me. He was training the twelve to preach what he preached, to do what he did, to serve as he served. And he says, you don't have to be more than me. You don't have to have better numbers than Jesus. You don't have to have better success rate. You don't have to have more acceptance. It is enough, Jesus says, to be like me. Imitate Christ. Isn't that what we're always supposed to do anyway? And so if we're supposed to do that in every area of life, when it comes to witnessing, imitate Christ. Remember what uh, in the pre-services, those of you that were here, what did, uh, what did, what did Brother Frazier take us through? The encounter Jesus had with the woman at the well. Why? Because we ought to imitate Christ in witnessing. And so uh, Jesus makes another statement here, and he says... Uh, and the servant's not above his Lord, or, or as his Lord, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? What in the world? What's Beelzebub? Well, Beelzebub was an ancient Canaanite god who was called the Lord of the Flies. I think they made a movie about that years ago. I don't know if it was, I never saw it. But anyway, the Jews used to use the term Beelzebub as a euphemism for Satan. So if they called Jesus Beelzebub, they were calling him Satan. All right? And so Jesus says, uh, it, you know, if, if they're calling me Satan, what are they going to call you? Demon, maybe? Um, and they're not going to call you anything worse than that. That's what he's saying. He's saying, how much more shall they call them of this household? Jesus is saying, they're not going to call you anything worse than they called me. They already called me Satan. And so, you know, the, the more they would be like Christ, the more they would be treated like Christ. That's what he's saying. And the more they became like Christ, the more people would identify him that way and treat him that way. So as Jesus was preparing to tell them not to fear, he told his disciples to be like him. They didn't have to measure their success in any numerical way. They only had to be like Jesus, that was success in itself. And I think one of the greatest fears that I have in personal evangelism is the fear of failure and the fear, fear of rejection. I don't want to go to somebody all charged up, give them a track, be excited to tell them about the gospel, and have them take that thing and throw it down. Or, say I'm, or even just to say I'm not interested politely or, or curtly. I did have one guy um, when I was in Michigan. I, we were passing out flyers for vacation Bible school, and this guy was out watering his garden, and, and he uh, kind of turned the hose in my direction and got real close to my feet. You know, I've had that happen. That's in Michigan. They don't waste your time in Michigan. If they're not interested, they let you know. Amen. Uh, but anyway, uh, and, and, and you know what? Um, how do I... The fear of rejection is there. And, and we think witnessing is only successful if somebody gets saved as a result. Or if someone is even receptive to the gospel, we think, well, I planted the seed. Someone can come and water it. Amen. And we see it as failure and a waste of time if someone rejects the message or becomes hateful. And we, think because, we think that way because we're using the wrong unit of measurement. It's kind of like kilometers and miles per hour, right? In your car... Most of you, you've got the miles per hour on the top and the kilometers on the bottom. When I was in college, I had a friend from Canada, a guy, a guy in college from Canada. He got pulled over for speeding. And uh, the, in the, he had the Canadian license plate on from Ontario. And the police officer said, did you know how fast you're going? You're going X amount of miles an hour. And he's, he, he tried this. Now, this was not true, I don't think. But he said, oh, I was looking at kilometers per hour. He didn't buy it. He got a ticket. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're using the wrong unit of measurement when it comes to measuring success in witnessing. Success in witnessing does not depend on the reaction of the person you're talking to. Success in witnessing happens when we become like Christ. We begin to witness like Christ. And when we are treated like Christ was treated, we can say, success! even though it may not even be all that much fun. You know Christ had converts. 
I mean, even when, even when Jesus was on the cross, there was a group of ladies that were uh, standing far off watching him. There were people that stood at the foot of the cross. Um, Christ had converts, converts, but more people rejected him. Even the thousands who flocked to him weren't there when he died. He, uh, um, Christ was reviled. And then at the same time, Christ was accepted and loved by many who would turn to him. So that's success, is being like Christ. You know what? That's God's will for us in every area of life. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, to them he did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his Son. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be like. But we know that when, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're predestinated to be like Christ, and we will be like him someday. That is the goal. Why not get a head start? Amen? So God's ultimate goal for us is to be like Jesus Christ, and when you get that goal in your heart, you're no longer going to be afraid to be treated like Christ. Because now, you'll see that as success rather than failure. Galatians 6.17, Paul said this, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know what those marks were? Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said five times I've received 40 stripes save one. He's been whipped in the synagogues five times. Do you think there was marks? Probably his whole back was covered in the marks from those whippings. And he says, don't trouble me. I bear in my body the marks. Not the marks of shame. Not the marks of defeat. The marks of victory. The marks of the Lord Jesus. That was success for him to bear those. There are many ways in which we can imitate Christ. We can imitate His meekness. We can imitate, imitate the way He's served others in humility. We can imitate His care for the poor and the outcast and the downtrodden. We can imitate His holiness in His life as much as possible, and we should do all of these things. But this morning, when I say imitate Christ, I mean imitate Christ in our witnessing. In telling others, Jesus didn't ignore sin, he confronted it. Jesus, but, even, but even in confronting sin, Jesus did it in love, not in a con condemnation type of attitude. He did it in love with restoration and salvation in mind. The woman at the well, he said, you've had, you, you're right, you said you don't have a husband. You've had five and now you're shacking up with somebody. He confronted her with that sin. And then... Uh, he, he, uh, a woman was brought to him in adultery, John chapter 8, and what did he say to her? I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. So most importantly, to imitate Jesus in our witness, we have to see people as Jesus sees them, as lost souls needing a Savior. So if you want to get over your fear of witnessing, the first step in that process is imitate Christ. And the fear factor begins to diminish, but that's not all that's involved. What else must we do? Well, to witness without fear, you must not only imitate Christ, but you must fear God. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, imit, I'm going to witness without fear. How? I'm going to be afraid. What? To witness without fear, fear God. Look at verse 26. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed or hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are, able to kill the soul, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So, to get over this fear of, of witnessing, fear him. Fear God. Uh, when I was in college, I was, I, was what, I was a gym rat for a while. That means we just played basketball any chance we can. And uh, there was a bunch of guys playing basketball. I think it must have been a Saturday night or something, a Friday night. We're playing basketball in the gym, and, and we'd been playing for like two hours. I mean, we're going at it. And there was some kind of activity going on. And, uh, and the, the bleachers were pushed back, and the court was out there on the court. And uh, all of a sudden... Um, 
all the, all the ladies from the college, all the girls were, were coming in to assemble for something, and we're out there playing basketball, and I had the ball in my hands. All these girls showed up. And uh, I don't think I was playing all particularly well, but at that point, I received some extra motivation. <laughs> there was like, there was like 218 to 22 year old girls, and here I am with the ball in my hands, bringing it up the court. And this guy I've been playing against was way better at basketball than me, and he'd been beating my tail the whole night. But anyway, I got to about seven or eight feet behind the three point line. All these girls are filing in. And he was back a couple of steps, and sure enough, I launched a three-pointer. <laughs> and it went in. <laughs> now, my three-point percentage, I've never kept track of it in all the pickup basketball I've played, but it was not high. Um, and, and I'm more like a center guy, you know? And, and here I am, I just launched it, and it went, I mean, it didn't hit it, nothing but net, all right? And the guy I've been play, I'd been playing against, he, we're, his name is Shad. My name's Chad. His name is Shad. He spelled it wrong. But anyway, he looked at me. He was so mad because he had the same motivation I did. <laughs> he said, you, he said some things to me. Um, anyway, he didn't say anything bad, but and he's, I can't believe you did that. Um, you know why I shot that shot? because I wanted to impress somebody, all of them if possible. <laughs> but I didn't realize something after a while later talking to some of them. None of them cared. <laughs> they didn't care. They weren't there to watch me launch three-pointers and sweat. I guess when you grow up with three brothers, you just don't understand what girls care about. You know what, uh, I didn't, um, we, when we fear man, most of the things that we do are done in, in order to impress people. You know that? Other men and women, that's called peer pressure, by the way. It doesn't just happen in school. And we never really realize that few of them, if any, are ever impressed with what we're doing. They're too busy trying to impress everybody else with what they're doing. So when we fear God, we do what we do not to impress somebody else, but to impress Him. So here Jesus says, fear not them in verse 26. Now who's them? Well, them is all the people who oppose the gospel that Jesus has just described from, from verses 9 all the way through verse 26. All these people, even the people, especially the people who are calling Jesus Satan, that would be the Sanhedrin, that would be the scribes and the Pharisees that are accusing him of being Satan. Jesus says, don't fear them. Why not? They're pretty fearful. Why shouldn't his disciples fear these guys? Because God is king of all eternity, he says. Because he is sovereign over the world. He is God. He's a sovereign king who is going to set all things in order someday. Verse 26, he says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. In other words, he is saying there is a reckoning coming. There is a scorekeeper. There is someone that is watching, and he is in charge. And because of that, don't fear. He's going to expose all the hidden wickedness. He's going to expose all the hidden righteousness. In verse 28, Fear not them, same people, which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see the contrast here? There's them and there's Him. There's them that are against the gospel, and there's him that is going to bring everything to light and that can punish both soul and body in hell. And, and we stand in the middle, and you can fear them or fear him, Jesus says. You can't do both. And so, why shouldn't we fear men? Because they can't do anything permanent to us. They can kill the body, yeah. Ask any of those Christian pastors recently who've been beheaded in Egypt. Ask him if it's worth it. Well, you can't now, but, you know, someday. Ask the martyrs who spilled their blood for the Word of God. When you get to heaven, 
Ask Peter, who was crucified upside down, and say, hey, that was pretty tough, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it worth it? I'd do it again. Who are mowed down in the prime of life. Jesus says, guys, when you wrap your mind around the concept that God knows everything and that God controls everything and, and, and that God is going to punish or reward everything, you begin to fear God instead of them. And pretty soon, you don't care what men think. You don't care what men do. You will do what you do because you want to please Him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Wherefore, whether you eat, or whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Get Christians pray in hushed tones in a restaurant because we aren't even eating and drinking to the glory of God many times. That's fear. Many times we're paralyzed by fear so much that we cannot utter the words that God the Holy Spirit wants us to utter to a lost soul that we're trying to impress for the wrong reason. We care what that person thinks and not what God thinks. In, you know what? Uh, the king of Israel, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, he sums up what it's all about. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Sum up life for us. Here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But he was not done there. He said, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether the work be evil. We must fear God. That's our duty. And that will drive out of us the fear of man, which is our fear of witnessing. That's, that's what it is. So there's one more thing, though. Uh, that goes along with fearing God that will help us to witness without fear and drive our fear away. What is it? It's this. Not only, not only imitate Christ, not only fear God, but lastly, trust God. Trust His good intentions for you. Trust His love for you. Many of you are able to do that financially. You, you give your tithe, you give offerings, and, and you trust that God is going to reward that. Can you not do the same thing in witnessing? John MacArthur uh, comments on verse, well, let's look at this first, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? John MacArthur explains what this money, money is this farthing, it's an Assyrian, which is the smallest coin in circulation in Jesus' day. All right? It was worth one sixteenth of a denarius, and one such farthing could buy two sparrows, which are pretty, were pretty useless back then as they are today. But in New Testament times, the roasted sparrows were often served as cheap finger food or an hors d'oeuvre or something like that. And that's what Jesus, you might look at them and say, why would you buy two sparrows? He's talking about um, a snack, all right? Ew, I know. <laughs> uh, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And yet one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, for ye are more value than many sparrows. They're worthless. They're not even good food, yet God attends the funeral of every sparrow. He cares. He's instant, intimately involved with these little birds, all of his creation. Matthew 6, 26, God feeds every bird every day. That's a lot of food. God is so involved with you that He has numbered your hairs. Now I know some of you that's not as easy, you know, not as hard as others. Um, and and He's got. But did you know that the average human head has 140,000 hairs? Some 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 are above average. Some of you try to make up for that by growing it down here, you know. But uh, and then I make I grow it up here, and I can't grow it down here. So we make up for it, right? Jesus told his disciples, though, don't fear. You see, you see how much God cares about you? He's so involved in the minute details of your life, and even in the basis creatures he's, he's involved. Don't you know that he loves you much more than them? The point is this, all right? When somebody loves you, truly loves you, and you know that person loves you, and you know that they have good character, 
You can trust that person. God loves you. God sends you forth as sheep into a wolf's den. But you can trust him. You say, well, God, don't do that to me. That's bad. No. What does Romans 8, 28 say? We know all things work together for good to them who are the called, to, that, to them that love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. You can trust him even when it's not fun. Even when you face rejection and opposition. When you witness and you face opposition, don't get mad at God. Don't wonder where he is and why he isn't doing anything about it. Trust him. And the reason why you can trust him is that he loves you dearly. Because he loves you dearly, he will never do anything that is bad for you, even though it may seem that way at first. When you get to heaven, ask yeah, just ask Peter. Was that bad for you to die for the sake of Christ? No. Um, ask the apostles. So if you have a negative experience in witnessing, if you do it for a while, you will. If you have a negative experience in witnessing, rejoice. It is good for you. And, if, and you can trust God for knowing that he loves you. And he's with you to empower you to witness. In a moment here, they're going to come and bring an invitation to him. Fear and witnessing is the real problem for many, for, for us. We're scared of the reaction. We're afraid to be fools for Christ's sake. I mean, we have our dignity to think about, don't we? I like my dignity. I want to keep it. I don't want other people to have it. We're afraid to be fools for Christ's sake. We're afraid maybe we'll get the message wrong or something. But Jesus says, no, he commands, don't fear. How? Well, imitate Christ. Fear God and trust God. Pray for laborers. Are you still praying for laborers? Wasn't our prayer answered last week? When the harvest, the plenteous harvest, we all talked about this in Sunday school. Nobody believed that was going to happen. <laughs> it wasn't our faith that brought it down. God happened. Pray for laborers and then volunteer to be an answer to your own prayer. Let God have your fears. When you walk out, there's a track rack down there. Take one with you. Start, if you have to, start, start small. Take one with you and say, this week, I, I'm, I'm afraid. You know, if, if you're afraid, guess what? You're like me. Right, take one with you and say, I'm going to find someone to give this to. Even if I have to just leave it with my tip at the restaurant. Leave a good tip if you're going to do that, by the way. <laughs> if I have to leave it at a restaurant for a tip. I'm afraid to put it right in someone's hand. What did Jim say this morning? You said, two different places, two different cities, someone handed you a gospel track, and that helped bring you to Christ. Plan to give, to give someone the gospel. When fear defeats you, you miss out on the prize. Just like those contestants in Fear Factor. Oh, they tried and they gave up. And they, I'm sure they're sorry now. All right.